excited to be talking about one of my favorite paintings at the James with you today, uh, A Time for Every Purpose by Jim Vogel. And I wanted to ask you if you could tell me a little bit about the, the artist and his influences. Well, I think that he was influenced by the American Regionalist artists and that their movement was from about 1930 to 1940. And uh, the American Regionalists came about uh, because they were kind of an antithesis to the European modernism, which was a more abstract art movement and art was going in an abstract direction. And the realists came in about the time of the Great Depression. And in around 1929, the two, two major realists that we're talking about here are Thomas Hart Benton and Grant Wood. And I think everybody knows Grant Wood's armor and his wife with the pitchfork, you know, because it's so severe and it's used in a lot of commercial advertising right now. This is a, a more recent painting, but it does remind me of the artists of the 1930s. So yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the American regionalists started traveling around the Midwest and the South and just painting what they saw. And they kind of took the history of art back a step because they, they took it more to, towards uh, realist paintings and their, all of their figures were really modeled. What would I say? It's called plasticity, where they look like they're really round and they're really real. real. And they went back in that direction. They started telling stories about the common man, which was probably reflected the time it was in. And I think... I think also where uh, he, Vogel sort of tapped into that was he comes from a family of storytellers. And so he wanted to tell a story and the American regionalists were also telling story. And he harkens back to that to a certain extent. I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the composition of this piece. The shape of it is so unusual. It kind of reminds me of something you might see in a church. It's interesting because the painting is a shape painting. And I'm pretty sure that he probably found the frame first and then had the canvas built in that particular shape to go into it. So the shape of the canvas actually becomes part of the composition. But yeah. also tells a story. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the, about what the artist does. To, you, you described how the artist used color and composition to make things, to, to manipulate the viewer. And it made me look at every piece in the, in the James a little bit differently. So I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Okay, well the color, he does use the color and he uses it very strongly. And it, if we want to talk about the color first, what, he, what he's done is he's taken the, the top part of it and he's made it all blue, like the solid blue, like a sky background uh -huh. with some swirly things in it. And he's, he's put the figures in front of that. So immediately started what we call a figure ground relationship. So you read the blue as the background and read the figures in front of that. He's done that. Then he's also used complementary colors to a great advantage. And uh, the theory of complementary colors is that uh, there are three uh, primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And if you uh -huh. combine those, you get the secondary color. So a complement, and you put them around a little circle, which is called a color wheel. And the complement is one of those primaries and it's opposite. So it's opposite will be a secondary. So he's used blue, which is a primary, and orange, which is a secondary, which is red and yellow mixed together. So he's taken those two complements and he's put them together. And I uh, always like to say that a color is never so happy as when it sits with this complement, because uh -huh. what enhances it. So that's why they're orange, is to highlight them next to the blue and make them stand out. Right, right. So, so that intensifies both of the colors and helps give a lot of movement to the composition. He's done that, and then the plasticity of the figures, which we talked about earlier. How the furrows in the shirt and mirroring the furrows of the, the greenery and the, the, the planting, and it all just combines to make this moving piece come alive to me, yeah. I think. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the composition. The perspective is distorted. You have these three groupings that tell the story. It's someone digging an irrigation ditch and then someone opening the blockage to, to let the water through, which of course is necessary to plant. You have water and then you have earth. And, and then the middle part is really the heart of it. The man planting the corn and the older woman reaping the corn. And these two figures form a circle combined at the bottom by the corn and the hands, these outsized hands. And then to the right, you have the, the man chopping the wood, you know, which is the, the product of what's been reaped, and the woman putting the, the wood to the fire to cook the corn. Is there anything you can talk about, the perspective or the composition, anything else? Well, he intentionally does not want these figures to be realistic. You know, he sort of made them more what we would call expressionistic. And he is 
change the perspective, well, the proportions of the figure because the hands are huge. And when you learn to draw a face in a hand, like, like you're doing anatomy, your face is, is supposed to be the height of your hand. So if you go like this, that's, wow. yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. So if you're trying to do it anatomically correct, if you look at this, it, it's no, no way near it because the hands are huge in comparison to the size of the face. So, but if you want to talk about how he's unified it, uh, there's a theory called Gestalt theory, which uh, in the art world, it just sort of means that if you draw a tree, you, you don't have to put in every leaf. You can put in a couple of leaves and then the viewers will finish it off in their brain. Their brain will figure it out and they'll figure it out. Same thing with the field. You don't have to draw every blade of grass. So in this particular one for the Gestalt part, he has unified it by... Uh, he's had some of the figures touching. He's got that whole bottom swath of the canvas that is all these figures, and that is unified by the line, the undulating line, and the movement that goes through it. That unifies the entire bottom up part of the canvas and brings that together. So you read it, you don't see every nuance of it, but your your brain is going to figure it out anyway. I, I was never aware of that. I, I know the word, but I was never aware of that in art, and now I'm going to go look at more paintings and look at it and look at Gestalt theory and see that in a whole new way too. Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, psych, it's a psychological theory. So, but it, you know, it works in art, works in many different things. Uh-huh. Wow. You know, I also, I, I know that the overriding theme of this is community. And even mm -hmm. though most of the, the figures only relate to each other in pairs, it, it is community because what each of them does stands on the shoulders of the other. You couldn't have the planter and the, the reaper without the people providing the water to grow the plants. And, and you couldn't be, you know, be cooking the food without growing it first. So really, it's, they're all united in a common purpose. You know, it, 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 the title, I, I remember reading about other artists in the James and how they, they spend a lot of time picking the title and the title becomes an intrinsic part of the work. And I think he does this because it's the, the title is uh, A Time for Every Purpose, which is right from Ecclesiastes. And we all know the song uh, that Peter, Paul, and Mary sang. I think it was the birds, maybe the, the, birds, the yeah. first wrote it. And it's, it's, you know, for everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to mourn, a time to dance. But what most people don't know is the second part of this chapter that I think goes right to the heart of this painting, how it glorifies the, the working man and sanctifies him. And it says, I have seen the labor God has given to the children of man. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has put eternity into a man's heart. I think when you think of that and just, it raises this painting to a whole new level. It does, it does. And they become archetypes. Yes, which is, which is a good thing.